So I'm going to move on. There's actually a video right here. I don't want you to watch it because I want you to listen. I hope this one plays. If it doesn't, I'm going to take the time to load it, okay? Um, because I want you to listen and I want you to figure out as best you just make up a story in your brain as best you can about what's going on. Okay, everybody cross their paws. So, but we should have... Yeah, I'll get it, babe. gravity of that dog standing we'll talk about it later this afternoon now I want yeah, to it, oh, it's her oh I know who it is now oh I would call that friendly and frustrated oh right and highly aroused just friendly up. frustrated and highly aroused <laughs> okay. Aww. Aww. All right, here's another one. Hang on, it's there. And this is this is a little bit more confusing. That's not vocalizations. Pay no attention to that. So it's sort of interesting to try to figure out what's what. You don't need much more. So this is what you're listening to. That's what that noise was. I know, so that person is right. Well, I know. It's like, and you're torturing your dog in order to maybe get, get hopefully, to get interesting growls? Okay. So you saw the difference, right? And, and pay a special attention to the low growly and the high tonal, right? All right. So there's some more research that is, is relates to dog-dog. Um, not so much to, to people and dogs, but to dogs and dogs. So... Farago in um, Europe, and there's so much great stuff going on in Europe, by the way. Um, there are some great programs you can jump into in Scotland, Hungary. Um, uh, there's all kinds of great stuff going on over there. So, so this group, Farago's group in Budapest and Vienna, recorded growls from dogs in three contests during play, a tug game, uh, resource guarding, guarding a bone from another dog, and reacting to a, quote, threatening stranger. So basically, first of all, there were indeed structural differences. The play growls during play were shorter and higher pitched. So this whole long short is highly variable. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But the pitch is exactly what you would expect. What they couldn't find is by measuring the fundamental frequency and in the internode interval. And you know, I did this for my PhD. It's very tedious, although it's a lot easier now with all kinds of computer programs. But they couldn't find a statistical difference between the resource guarding growls and the threatening stranger growls. They basically looked, sounded, and 
and statistically looked very, very similar. You could not separate them out statistically in terms of the features that they quantify. But the dogs could. The dogs, the, the resource grounding growls, what they did is they put a dog in a room and they put a bone down and then they played the growls that had been, that had, it's a playback study. They do them all the time in animal behavior in other species. So they took the growls that that were about telling a dog to stay away from their bone, resource guarding growls, and those were the ones that were most effective at keeping a dog away from the bone. Even though we couldn't tell the difference between these two, the dogs could. So there's something there that was very meaningful to them. So we have a lot to learn about exactly what information is being conveyed. Before we move on, I just wanted to talk a little bit about growling and how much I love it. Um, and I, I think I'm singing to the choir here. I don't think I need to say a whole lot about this, but, but I just, I do want to say, please don't take the growls away. <laughs> it was Ian Dunbar who was the first person um, I ever heard say that. It had a profound effect on me. I, it's how many years later? It's, you know, it was 1986. 1985. By the way, the first seminar I ever went to was an Ian, Dun Ian Dunbar seminar in 1985 or so. He said it was the last seminar he was ever going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when people say, is this the last seminar you're ever going to do? I always remember that. I go like, well, not, not, not maybe. <laughs> oh. But so, so he, he said it, and it had a profound effect on me, and I think it's still really true. Don't take away the growl. The growl is a very valuable warning system. The last thing we want is a dog who, out of the blue, um, goes after somebody. So you need to figure out the source of the problem and not take the growl away. So growling, however, has an impact on us as primates. It is a threatening vocalization. It is scary to hear. I actually conditioned myself when I was seeing so much aggression. I mean, I'd see four to five aggression cases a day, year after year after year after year, four to five days a week for a lot of years. And, you know, I saw dogs who really hurt people, and I was in a little room, and you can get hurt, right? You know, it's like, yes, well, then it was 27 stitches, and, you know. And, um, so you're writing all this down while the dog's beside you. And so, so you know, I, I realized that I really needed to condition myself to not respond to a growl, obviously I need to respond to it, but not respond in that sort of like, ugh, you know, frightened kind of primate way. So I literally conditioned myself to, to enjoy growls and to enjoy seeing teeth. So I literally got to the point of like, wow, those are really cool teeth. Look at how white and shiny they are. You're such a big guy. Look at your teeth. Um, and growls, what I did with growls is I would just become, an, I would put my ethology hat on and I would go like, that's an interesting growl. I wonder what a picture of it would look like. I wonder how low the fundamental frequency is. I wonder, you know, so just, just try and whenever you find yourself feeling a little like, ooh, um, and say, how many of you work with behavior problems with aggression? How many of you are trainers who like deal with aggression or have a dog or I don't know, have walked down the street and had a dog scare you? Probably, you know, everybody is, the more you can get so you can sort of morph into that other place of, isn't that interesting? I'm going to try and describe that now. It's a really good thing. The only thing I'll caution you about is if you go too far away, then, 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 then you become so distanced that you start describing things and not responding, <laughs> um, which is not really good. And I actually, I used to do that. All my training was in being an observing ethologist and describing and watching and observing. And when I started hurting, literally, I'm not making this up, a friend of mine said, I wonder why you're so bad at this. <laughs> they literally said that. And, 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 and she was right, and I was. And the problem was, is I would stand there and watch my dog and go, I'd, I'd be like, isn't that interesting? Do you, do you see right before he rushes into the sheep, his left ear goes back? And she was like, get out there! And it took me a couple of years to get off of the observant train, so be a little careful. Um, but whenever you can, put on your observer hat, because observer hat, it's, it's really a useful thing to do. I wanted to make one point here about discriminating growls from other vocalizations. There, this can get a little tricky. How many people have heard a Rottweiler 
when you ask them to lie down, go. So is that a growl? Well, the owner always says it's not, right? I always thought it was, but I thought it was more than Rottweiler just sort of saying like, yeah, and your mother, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll lie down. You know, your mother eats kitty litter. Um, but I don't know. I have to tell you, Willie has what I call, dog odor, a moan. So when, he's, when he and I are lying spooning and I'm rubbing his belly, or he'll, he loves to put his head against my head and my neck, and of course I just hate it. And, <laughs> and he goes like, hmm. And, and I do it back now. We have this little talk, it's like, hmm. So I sort of moan back and forth. And I was working in physical therapy. A lot of you know he had a serious injury, he's in physical therapy. And he lay down, he, he knows acupuncture, which means lie down on your side. And I said, acupuncture, and she touched his belly, and he went, oh, and she said, don't growl at me. She's very nice, she's very sweet. She said, oh, Willie, don't growl. And I said, like, that's not a growl, that's a moan. And they thought, oh, my God, I sound just like all this. <laughs> he didn't growl, he didn't moan. <laughs> but I think it was, because it was the same context. Willie is capable of growling. He doesn't do it very often, but, but he is. We need to be thoughtful about how you respond to it. Be very careful. I think we need to respond to a growl that's truly, we're sure, is made as a threat. I think it's very important to respond. I don't like to use positive punishment because I don't want to take the growl away, but I don't think we should ignore it either. I think that can be a big mistake. Um, there might be workarounds where you can teach a dog an incompatible behavior, fine. Maybe you can counter condition it and that will take the motivation for the growl away. But especially when it's like between you and your own dog and the dog sort of looks at you and goes like, uh, I think we need to respond to it. And so my response is, first of all, is I use a low voice. I don't make it growly, but I use a low voice. And I'll say, like Willie, um, when he was an adolescent, he used to growl over his feet getting rubbed. And, and when he would do that, I'd say, oh, you silly boy. You cut that out. You silly boy. So I wouldn't say, oh, silly boy. It's like, oh, you silly boy. You cut that out. I'm gonna do your, I'm gonna do your paws. I don't care. Uh, and so I'm using a low voice, but I'm not getting, oh, I'm not giving it back. You know, I'm not like, you give me your mad energy, I'll give you my mad energy back. I'm not doing that. You don't ever want to do that with any adolescent, whether dog or human, right? So I'll use a low voice, but I sort of, I basically sort of like, please, you know, it's not going to work on me, yo. Um, so think about how you respond to a growl and adjust what you do based on what we talked about today. So I want, I want to talk about um, other, this is Sky. This is one of the pictures, again, that was sent when I asked for, for book covers. Um, that's just... Look at, look at those teeth. They are gorgeous teeth. And those are big canines, too. You don't usually see them. I like the, I, I think that's just so pretty. Um, so, Sky. So, huffs, snorts, chatters, whines, and howls. I'm not going to talk too much about howling. Some dogs howl, some don't. It's a, we think it's a kind of a contact call. There's mobbing, which is short, rapidly repeated notes. Howling is that long, continuous woo. We think it's a contact call, but it also, it's like barking in that it has two receivers. One is my pack, and the other is my territory, I'm here. That's where it came from. I think dogs use it for a lot of reasons now. I think huskies use it basically randomly and arbitrarily, is the best I can tell. Um, I wanted to talk. I, I'm not sure huffs and snorts are different. I was sort of looking at the literature and some people talk about huffs, some people talk about snorts. Um, I'm talking about an, an abrupt escalation of breath. <laughs> you know, it's not, so snort isn't, it's like we snort by going <laughs> like that. That's not so much what I mean, it's that exhalation. Chuffing, chuffing. that's a better word, chuff, huff, chuff. <laughs> um, and you saw my face when I did it because I've been watching Willie really carefully since he was badly injured. He was badly injured in February, um, 11 months ago. He's still not back. He's, st he's still not back. Um, hopefully he will be by summer. But he, tra he, he destroyed his shoulder pretty much and literally had to live for 23 and a half hours without moving for many, many months. 
and it's a border collie, <laughs> five years old, okay? God bless me, yes, thank you. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was hard. Um, but many of you have been through this, right? At least he wasn't an adolescent. He was injured, that same shoulder was injured when he was an adolescent. So here's what I learned, one of the things, many of the things I learned on that, which was that his, his chuffs, his huffs increased. And, I, and the context in which I see them consistently is when he appears to be frustrated. You see that? Does everybody else see that? I, there are a lot of dogs who never do it. But he will do it like, I'll get out the leash and then forget something on the computer, right? Or get out the leash or, or say, let's go on a walk, um, which on the farm is never on a leash, but so I like put on my boots, put on my coat, and then the phone rings. And he'll, he'll do that chuff, huff, snorty thing. So that, I think that's a good indicator in some dogs of frustration. Other dogs, Willie would never do that high husky howl, you know. But Willie's isn't like, oh, please. Like somebody said, pleading. I, you know, there's a reason pleading. Because when we plead, we get high voiced and long. I mean, that was a very good emotional underpinning to that high and long sound. Um, Willie's not pleading. I think he's really frustrated. And, you know, he's like, oh. It's like, it's like the equivalent of, oh, basically. So there's a little bit of anger to it, I would argue. And that's, I think, part of why it's so much lower. So chatters. Um, I, the chatters I've seen, I don't have a video of one, but have you seen dogs who just start going, uh, the only context I've seen it in is when dogs are highly aroused and can't act on it, which is exactly when cats do it, by the way. You see a cat in the window and there are birds outside the window? Uh, start doing that. They do it when, I think, they're frustrated and they want to get something and they can't. Um, but they're aroused. They're not sort of angry frustrated. They're just like, uh. I had a very aggressive, a dog dog aggressive dog, Misty, who I'll show you a little bit later. Misty would get a hard eye looking at Lassie or one of my other female dogs and I'd say, Misty, get back. It's my, one of my favorite signals to teach dogs. Just back up. It's a wonderful, wonderful consequence. Back up. They didn't like to back up. But it's a lovely, you can teach it in all positive ways. You know, it's just back up. Just, and it's sort of like sit down. It's the cop equivalent of sit down. OK, everybody just sit down, right? It's like, OK, just back up. Um, and then lie down. Misty, stay there until you calm down. And she lay there going. <laughs> so aroused, she was literally beside herself. And, and when, once her jaw and her mouth relaxed, then I'd say, okay, fine, now we're going, now we're back again. Um, so, anything else about vocalizations anybody else wants to bring up? That's sort of, oh, sneezing, thank you. Sneezing, by the way, one of your colleagues, a nurse, came up and told me that reverse sneezing is a dog version of gagging. How cool is that? Who knew? Who was that? Where are you? There she is. Our resident nurse and, and medical biologist, so you can talk to her at break. So sneezing, I have seen, that's really good. I've seen dogs sneeze when I think they're like conflicted or excited. What do you guys think, sneezing? Excited? It can be confusion. Confusion? A kind of a cutoff signal? She said she thinks her dog does it to, to sort of defuse things when they're playing. It's a great cutoff signal, right? You know, you sort of sneeze and you stop everything. Oh, her dog does it to solicit play. I think part of sneezing, and I'm speculating here, think about this. We don't have time to talk about it too much. Um, but, but I think part of sneezing is, I think dogs learn to sneeze to manipulate their environment to affect the behavior of others really quickly. Yes, you agree with that? Okay. Okay, one more question that we need to move on. The very back. Ah. Oh. Her dogs do it in the morning when they're greeting each other. So it's sort of like a wake up, greet. <laughs> My dogs don't sneeze a lot, you know? So again, you know how different people are in terms of vocalization. Some people are chatty, some people are not, some people sing, some people like me can't. So dogs vary tremendously. Okay, let me talk about, we're going to still talk about sound. 
Let me talk about us using sound. So I want to talk about now, about given some of the things we know about canine vocalizations, is how should we use sound? How can we mo best use sound to communicate with our dogs? It just so happens. It just so happens I did a dissertation on this. <laughs> just so happens. Funny I should bring this up, right? Um, this is actually what my PhD dissertation was on. Um, I literally fell into it like falling down a rabbit hole when I did a master's, actually I did a senior honors thesis as a senior in college um, on visual signals. I was interested in communication in sheep herding. You know, you got three species there. So how did this communication all work? So. At first, I focused on the dog communicating with the sheep, and with border collies, as you know, it was all visual. Never heard barking. There are herding dogs who bark, but not border collies, so it was all visual. So I did a lot of research on that. Um, but, but I noticed that because the dogs are watching the sheep, that handlers, most of the handler signals were not visual to their dogs, they were vocal. And I, and, and I started listening, I thought, well, this is a really interesting system, because they have they have a kind of a um, dual language in which they have, they have signals with the same meaning that can be either whistled or spoken. And you use whistles when the dogs are far away because whistles don't degrade as fast as sound does. And this, by the way, is something for everybody to, to keep in mind. With, it, you don't have to be a sheep herder to have this be practically important to you. One of the things you learn when you get involved in herding, if you're smart enough to go to the other end of the field and sit with the people who set the sheep out. So if you haven't been to a trial, you have a dog and a handler standing at a post. The sheep are set out from two to 800 yards away. It's a really long way. Um, and, and there are people who, there's a whole pen of sheep sort of behind that. And then there are people who bring three to five whatever sheep out hold them there in position and tell your dog can pick them up. If you sit in that area, you hear what the dog hears when they're 600 yards away or even 100 yards away. And it's not what you think it is because it's not what you're saying. So lie down sounds like I mean, really, it's, they have no idea what you're saying. So if your dog is at a distance from you and they're not listening to you, it's sometimes it's because they're not listening to you. And sometimes it's because they have no idea what you're saying. If you want a dog to work at a distance from you, you need to learn whistles because they carry really, really well. So what I did, um, and you can look it up, part of it is in animal behavior, some of it's in perspectives and ethology. Um, basically what I ended up doing is I recorded the vocal signals from professional animal handlers who spoke not each one of them, but in total, I think, it, I think it was 19 different languages. I basically, I didn't travel a lot, I didn't travel around the world, I wish I could, but I was very opportunistic. I spent a lot of time, um, for example, in Wyoming, where there are people who actually come in on three-year green cards to work as shepherds in these really isolated sheep farms. Um, Peruvian Quechua, which is extremely unique language. Linguists do not where to, know where to put it. It's not a Romance language, has no relationship to Latin, Italian, French, German, etc. Um, very, very different, different kind of language. I recorded them. I recorded visiting people would come to the University of Wisconsin. I recorded the Minister of Agriculture um, from China. <laughs> um, and I had him all work with a horse. So I recorded people actually as much as I could working with working horses and dogs from a whole range of things, from barrel racing to protection dogs to um, trotters. I almost fell off a sulky um, to race horses in Texas where I almost got killed for my tape recorder. Um, science is not boring. <laughs> it was mostly really fun. Um, so let me show you what I did and let me show you what I learned. First of all, these are three, three whistle sets from three different handlers. So I just want to go over again sound um, and, and what these sonograms mean. So these are frequency again, and this is time. So this sounds like This sounds like OK, got it? 
And a great thing for you to do is to go home and write out your vocal signals and make up what you think they look like. And one of the things that you learn when you do this is that you have some signals that start exactly the same way, like this starts just like this, right? And one of the things I learned in my research is that dogs pay attention to the first, about the first 300 um, milliseconds of a sound. So, so 0.3 second of a sound, they've already made their decision about what to do. So you need to think about whether your signals sound start the same, because if they do, then you're going to confuse your dogs. I don't actually have it keyed up here, but I have a video of, of me um, from, feel, it's in the feeling outnumbered video, and I say, dogs, wait. And then I'm going to, they're all waiting, and then I say their name to let them jump into the, the car. So I say, dogs, wait. And all four dogs wait, and then I say, Lassie, and I have Luke. And when I go, Ugh, both of them lean forward. Right. And I was like, oh, don't name your dogs with the same first letter. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. What I found was, first of all, I, I analyzed the sounds of all these different vocalizations, both words and whistles, from people signaling dogs and horses especially in different contexts. And I divided them into stimulating signals versus inhibiting signals. So were you asking your horse to speed up or were you asking your dog to lie down and stay? Inhibiting, right? Were you asking your dog to hurry up faster to get the sheep? Stimulating. Were you asking your dog to come to you? Stimulating. Were you asking your horse to stop? Inhibiting. Um, and then I also recorded, so I compared those across handlers, but then I also recorded within handlers. So how do you change your voice depending on what you want your, do your animal to do? So this is, a, um, this is actually a barrel racer. She's on a horse. I'm beside her with a um, recorder on my chest. And I basically, so I said, ask your horse, the horse is standing still, and I said, ask your horse to walk. So she went, <coughs> standard vocalization to a horse. <coughs> her horse started getting fussy. Um, and trotting and being silly and shaking his head. And I said, okay, I need another example. And she said, he's getting too silly. I don't want to do this again. And I said, well, do it in a way. Do, do it however you need to do it, but get him walking. And she said, okay. So what she did is she decreased the number of notes and she increased the inner note interval. Okay? So now she's on her horse. She's actually, I'm standing still, and she's asked to run by me as fast as she can. I had the, I had the mic. I didn't have the technology to put a mic on her at that point. Um, so I'm, I'm here, and right when she got to me, she was supposed to um, ask her horse to, to, she's loping, and she's supposed to ask her horse to speed up. Other times, she was starting as fast as she could. She got to me, she's supposed to ask her horse to stop. So this is speed up. And this is go as fast as possible. She increases the number of notes, and she decreases the inner note interval. All right? So keep watching. So these are inhibiting signals. And some of these, this is a horrible slide. I apologize. Some of these are so old. So you'll see some slides that have, it's just, they're just not pretty. But it's old stuff. So I haven't redone all of it. So these are inhibiting signals from a barrel racer speaking English, a jockey um, who speaks Spanish, a uh, racetrack workout boy who speaks English, and a dressage trainer who speaks English. This is just from the work I did in Texas. So inhibiting. This is you're on a horse, ask your horse to stop. Barrel racer. Whoa. Spanish-speaking jockey. Whoa. Oh. Um, workout boy. Whoa. Dressage trainer, where transitions need to be slow and fluid, who's happened to be working with a horse who was too aroused. Whoa. Okay, there's a pattern here, right? So um, another part of my research, these are the puppies that I did an experiment on. I basically, I had four litters, uh, um, three border collies and a beagle. <laughs> um, and we raised the puppies in a, in a, it was an isolated but not environment. Basically, we could not use sound with any contingency. So we couldn't say, good puppy, and pet them. We actually 
had to, I trained all the handlers. It took a long time, a lot of biofeedback. We were all trained to speak in complete, total, monosyllabic syllables. When we were allowed to use inflection and prosodic features of, of sound, we actually scared the puppies. <laughs> Are we good? So, so, so we had to use these monosyllabic tones. It was very challenging for us. We spoke like this in a monotone all the time. The only thing we were allowed to do is to learn to growl. Everyone was allowed to growl. Everyone was allowed to learn to growl because we had to. We had little puppies, and we had them until they were over five months old, right? Yeah. So we had to. You know, it was hard to not ever say anything except in a complete monotone. So everybody learned to growl. And I will just parenthetically relate to you very quickly a story I think I write about in Other End of the Leash. I'm not actually clear. But it just so happened, I won't go into the details, but a gentleman um, who I knew professionally came up to the laboratory, um, a married gentleman. Um, and the, it was at night, and the married gentleman actually grabbed me from behind um, in a sort of frog-like amplexus um, <laughs> behavior. <laughs> um, and because I was so conditioned to never doing anything but speaking in a monotone voice or growling, I went, <laughs> <laughs> It was the most effective signal. <laughs> if you ever need it, do it. But I'll tell you one thing, they'll think you're insane. But what was cool about it is that I knew this man professionally. I saw him a lot later on. There were no words. We never talked about it. It's like, we, it's like it didn't happen, you know? Anyway, so um, the puppies were raised where we could only vocalize that way, but they were on, they had an indoor and outdoor kennels. They were on the seventh floor, or the really, well, fifth, seventh floor of a building on campus. And outside, they could hear campus sounds. They could hear people talking. They could hear bells. They could hear cars. So they could hear sound all the time, but there was no contingency. Okay? So what we did is we, first of all, um, uh, well, not first of all, but we taught them. This is one of the trainers. She has a tape recorder with a, with a tape loop in it. She has a little handheld device, and it could either go um, computer-generated or... Um, it could make, I think it was four actually, four short rising repeated notes or one long descending one. Puppies were trained to come to the trainer or to sit and stay. And, and half of them were trained to come originally to but halfway through we reversed everything. Once they got it, we changed it on them. This kind of reversal training is really common in psychology. It makes every animal their own control. So puppies who were trained to come to you to go to were then trained, oh, we're going to reverse it. We're going to, that, your come signal is now and your sit signal is and to make a lot of data very short, basically Four short, rising, short, repeated notes were without question the most effective. When you switched it, the puppies were like, oh, oh, I got it. They instantly got it. The ones you switched to the long descending signal were like, what? I don't get it. So the sound fit what you wanted. The sound fit the function. Um, the sound, I believe, short, rapidly repeated notes act to stimulate movement. We also did evoke potential recordings. Um, we sedated the puppies and, and shaved their heads and put little, this glued little electrodes onto their skulls, did a playback. There's a microphone here. We call this the whorehouse because we had all these curtains um, to, to be good sound insulators. There's a lot of very technical equipment to basically get evoke potential recordings from their brains. It's pretty gross, but it, I mean, sort of in, in not a very finely tuned way of looking at brain behavior, but still a very interesting one. And basically, to summarize what we found was when we played these four, or these six four, these six sounds, so you can see what we're changing. We're changing the number of notes from four short repeated ones to one long one. We're changing frequency modulation. Does it go up? Is it flat? Or does it go down? First of all, we played these, we did this before we did the training study. 
And we found, as you would expect, that the brain recorded and discriminated between those different features. It, it discriminated between sounds that went up versus sounds that went down. It discriminated between sounds that were repeated versus one long continuous one. It's not a surprise, but we needed to do that. After the training, the brains paid a lot more attention to one factor, which was the number of notes. Their brains didn't pay as much attention to whether the sound went up or down. They paid more attention to was it short, rapidly repeated notes or one single one. This is basically a summary that I used um, when I wrote up part of my work, is that these kind of sounds, which are short, repeated notes, which are called broadband notes, meaning, do you see how this is like a straight up and down wall of sound? This is, this is frequency. So let me give you an example of what this really means. Um, a sound that looks like that is, here's examples of them. That's an example. Huge amount of power in a whole range of low notes, medium notes, and high notes. Um, a whole lot of power in a whole range of notes versus sounds like these, which are more tonal like the whistles. Um, narrow band, they're called, not, not necessarily um, as broadband as this, but most importantly, short, rapidly repeated notes. To decrease the rate of movement or to soothe, and it turned out there were two categories, and I didn't quite realize there were two categories of inhibiting, but I discovered it after I did all this research. There are two different kinds of sounds people use. This is, if you ride, whoa, steady, if you work with a horse, you know exactly what I'm saying, right? If you work with a dog, stay, stay, stay there. So when you're working with working border collies, for example, you need, to, you need to have a big influence on not just what they're doing, but how sort of aroused on their emotional state. So with Willie, who's, who's highly reactive, it's Willie, lie down, stay there. So low voice inhibiting, not threatening in this case, um, but inhibiting, lie down, stay there, long and continuous, versus get up, oh, 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 right? Doesn't that just sort of make you more, generate some activity? What I didn't realize was there was a different category of inhibiting, which was you're already running as fast as you can, I want you to stop right now. So that's the, whoa, it's one note, and it often has this kind of a shape, or it's, or it's broadband, but it's short, but it's not repeated. Whoa, no, ah, hey, right? Those are, if, you, if you're like on a barrel horse and you really need to stop, you better pump out that whoa fast, right? Um, and if you're working a border collie and you want him to lie down and he's 200 yards away and he's chasing a panicked sheep, you don't want to go, lie down. <laughs> Right? It's part of the reason all border collies have names that are like this long. Will, cat, Meg. Because you need to be able to pump it out fast to, to, get their, to get their response. So here's another summary. And then before we wait for lunch, you guys are going to practice. Um, this, by the way, those are sonograms of bird mobbing calls. Just to tile this back together for you. Short, rapidly repeated, stimulating the action of their flock mates. Stimulating. Um, single whistle, long and slow. Slow down, calm down. Short, sharp whistle, whoa, stop instantly, pay attention. So we're going to do an exercise um, very briefly with your voice. So, um, so here's what we're going to do. First of all, what I want you to do is, is um, let's see, I want you to turn to a person next to you because you're going to talk to each other. So introduce each other and say your name. If there's three of you, work as a three, right? Hello, hello. Okay. All right, now what I want you to do is the person with the lightest hair is going to say their partner's name in a stimulating way. All right? <laughs> Do 
Sí, sí, Okay. Okay, now we're going to switch and the other person is going to say the other person's name in an inhibiting way. <laughs> okay. Okay, I have a question for you. Did anybody have to say Gwendolyn in a stimulating way? <laughs> did, you, did you notice some names are a lot harder? <laughs> there is a reason, as I said, you know, that, that some, some dogs in some fields have very short names. Um, here's, here's what I've learned. When I'm talking to my dogs, say for example, I say wait at the door. I talk in feeling at number and I talk a lot about dogs wait. Then I'll open the door and I'll release one dog at a time. I don't say okay because then they all go, they get confused. So I'll use their name because they all know their own name and they know it doesn't mean the other dog. So I'll say, dogs, wait. Open the door. And then rather than saying, look, 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 because that's just awkward, I'll, I'll, I'll modulate it a lot. I'll keep it high and I'll say, well, I'll use two. I used to go, look, 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 look. So repeated but really high, look, look. Um, Lassie, two syllables. So I would give a lot of rolling modulation, but again, very high voice, not low. So very tonal, not noisy. Lassie, Lassie, pip, pip, tulip. So when you go home tonight, think about your dog's names. Think about what you do with them. Think about how you use their name. Um, usually to get their attention is how we should usually be using their name. But think about it and think about the next time you name a dog, <laughs> What are you going to name them? I have one more exercise before we break for lunch. And, and this is really important. You guys can practice this later at home, at lunch, tonight. One of the things that I think separates great trainers from just good ones is an ability to use their voice separate from their own emotional internal state. Right? Great trainers, when they use their voice, will... Um, if they're like aroused and scared, they're panically, they can still say, lie down, Willie, lie down. Now I'm pretty good at it. I'm not close to perfect. There was, I don't know what happened. Something happened a couple of weeks ago that really scared me. I was really, truly, deeply scared. I think it was about his shoulder. Oh, it was the ice. It was icy and somebody let Willie out and they shouldn't have and I was afraid he was gonna destroy 11 months and $10,000 worth of work. And, 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 and I did not say, Willie, lie down. <laughs> Neither did I say, no, lie down, which is what I should have said. It was more like, lie down. <laughs> <laughs> you still lie down because I'm a lucky person. And I learned from Ian Dunbar that you should also teach your dog to listen when your voice goes all bluey. It's a really great thing to do in advanced classes. I used to have an advanced class at the farm. And um, we would, uh, everybody was on break. Their dogs are loose, they're off leash, they're in my pasture, they know the sheep are gated over here. And unbeknownst to them, I would lie and yell, the sheep are out, the sheep are out, down your dog. And you should have heard the lie down. <laughs> and we had a great discussion about like, you know, your dog needs to learn to lie down to that too. Let's finish up with sound. We have just a little bit more that I put in here because I think it's really relevant and it's some new fascinating research that has me cocking my head and just fascinated and I can't wait to hear what you guys think of it um, and what Kathy thinks of it. So here's some research that was done not too long ago by Lindsay Wood. This was her master's thesis. She's at Hunter College. She's a trainer, okay? So she knew what she was doing. I've seen some people, frankly, do clicker studies who had never used Kathy's knife, who had never used a clicker in their life. Um, there, are some, there are some studies out there. There are some of them are published, and I have to tell you, they're like, yeah, well, there's a problem here. <laughs> Lindsay's a trainer. She knows how to use a clicker. Um, so, at least as far as I know. Um, so, 20 dogs are trained to touch a target with their nose, classic classic 
clicker-related activity, right? Touch. Go over there and touch this. Ten were trained with a clicker, um, and ten were trained with the word good. So in both cases, that led to a treat, a food treat. We could have a long discussion about whether that's a bridge or a marker, but not today. Um, basically, it was either click or it was good, and then in both cases, it was treat. Clicker trained dogs were significantly faster to learn the behavior. Cool, all right, cool beats. Not really surprising. And one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons I like clickers when I use them so much is because of the properties of their sound. And I talked to Karen Pryor about this, and she was like, really cool, cool. Clickers, and by the way, these are not real sonograms. I made these up. That's Trisha, that's Trisha playing with her PowerPoint. Um, but after five years of studying sounds, you know, I'm not too bad at sort of making it up, right? Clicks are that perfect broadband short um, but, and very abrupt sounds. Clickers have an instant onset, it's called, and an instant offset. Click. You can sort of do it verbally. Click. Silence, full power sound, all power off. So one, instant onset, instant offset. One of, the, one of the things we know about the brain works and the way sensory neurons work is they look for something called the edge effect. They look for edges of things. Um, so anytime you have a discrete edge, you have an advantage in terms of getting attention. You also, remember I mentioned that this kind of sound has power in a lot of frequencies? So remember I talked about broadband sounds, basically? So there's power low, power high. Clicker is the ultimate broadband sound. And the acoustic receptor system in your brain and your dog's brain is tonotopic. And what tonotopic means is that every neuron is actually programmed to only respond to a certain frequency, a certain range of frequencies. So when you get a broadband sound like a click or a or a, those sounds turn on a huge range of frequencies because some neurons power in this range. Some neurons get turned on in this range. Other neurons get turned on in that range. So when you have power all the way through there, you have all these different neurons turning on. The whole switchboard lights up. So if you want to get an animal's attention, you want to sound like that. And I think that's part of why clickers are so incredibly powerful. It's just the perfect noise to get attention and to, to get classically conditioned to something else. This is a very sketchy uh, replicate of the fundamental frequency of good. Gh-uh-da. Gh-uh-da, right? So there's a little bit, guh, little bit of broadband there. Duh, little bit of broadband. Nothing like a click. It's way lower. Good. Longer, lower, more narrow band, less broadband. So it makes sense that if you're going to use sound, a clicker is a better sound. I actually, I am so profoundly disorganized and absent-minded that, that I decided I, just, I don't like always having a clicker with me. And I don't use a clicker for all training, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I use it especially for trick training or something dogs don't naturally do when I need to be really precise and capture something. Say, yes, that's it, and shape it towards what I want. Um, but I wanted to be able to use a kind of a marker without a clicker. And I spent, I spent all this time going like, should it be good? No, that's not a good enough sound. A lot of people say yes. I am not a fond of yes. Yes looks like yes. Nature's warning sound is a s. I know a million dogs beautifully trained to the word yes. Great dogs. So I'm not saying don't do it. I just don't like doing it. I just feel like I'm hissing like a snake. So I don't like, yes. And it's hard to be precise. Yes, you can't stop an S like you can something else, right? Um, so I was, I was trying to figure out, well, I'll try this, I could try that. And I put it on my blog, and somebody wrote back, you know, I just say click. And I was like, duh. Because <laughs> when you say click, it's not that different than, you know? 
it's, 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 what's that word, onomatopoetic? The sound of the word actually sounds like the event itself. Um, so, okay, if you're going to use sound, a clicker is a good one to use. But look at this. Whoa. Okay, this is Smith and Davis. Um, okay, so Smith and Davis, they taught 35 percentages to target a traffic cone. Very similar kind of exercise. With a clicker, in this case, they used either a clicker to mark the behavior or no marker at all. Now, we all know markers are incredibly valuable because it allows you to be precise and say, there, that's what you're getting the reward for. But look what happens. The clicker group was slower to learn. The dogs who were trained to click or good learned fastest if it was click. But the dogs who got no verbal marker at all got it faster. Holy moly. Right? This is when it's really good to sit back and look at our assumptions. Now, this is one study, so what does this mean? Here's what I think it means. And I'm going to talk about the fact that they were more, clicks were more resistant to extinction in a second. Here's what I think this means. This is just me, so we can have a discussion about it. When a dog is learning something new, and you give it some kind of acoustic feedback, and then give it food, is it possible that if what they're doing is relatively easy for them, something that dogs naturally do, that the sound is just a distraction? It just sort of diverts them from what they were doing? So here's my speculation. And it actually fit. This sort of fits with the way I use clickers. And I never did this intentionally. I can't take credit for this. I just sort of do this. I tend, like I said, I tend to use clickers when I'm teaching a dog to do something it doesn't normally do, because that's when you need that kind of precision. There, that's it. That's it. When you pick that, when you shifted your weight like that, that's what I want. Now I want you to pick that foot up. Click. Now pick it up higher. Click. Now pick it up higher. Click. Um, when I want somebody to do some to do something complicated or that I have to shape, I use a clicker. If I want a dog to sit or lie down or touch something with his nose. Dogs do that. It's not that hard, right? I don't use clickers, but I do say things. I do say, good dog, because I'm a human, and it's hard to keep my mouth shut, right? I'm a woman, and I'm a human, and it's hard to keep my mouth shut. But I'm not sure I'm doing my dogs any good when I say, good dog. One study, you don't want to make too much of one study, but it's still food for thought, right? Um, last thing that they found was that the clicker-trained dogs Took them, took them longer to learn. Now, how big a difference was it, by the way? Maybe not that much. I don't know. You know, might not have been that much. I, honestly, I don't remember how much slower they were. It was significantly different. But, you know, what else are we going to do but train our dogs, right? But the clicker-trained dogs were slower to extinguish. So what they did is they took the food away. So if the dog touched, the Basenji touched the cone, they got a click, but no food. Now, what I would argue, and I think every, I would be surprised if people didn't agree, is that the click has become a secondary reinforcer, right? So they're still getting reinforced. They're just not getting reinforced with their primary reinforcer. Ken Ramirez, um, Alta, do you have Ken's new tape? Ken did a seminar in Madison um, in October that uh, Towser Videos taped, and it's for sale back there. If you want to hear a phenomenal discussion about using secondary reinforcers to your advantage. It's on that video. It's really, really good. Um, anyway, so I think that's why it didn't extinguish, because they were still getting reinforced. It was just with a secondary reinforcer. So, so does that mean you shouldn't use clickers? No, not at all. Um, if you're comfortable with them, absolutely. But it does mean things are a little bit more complicated than we thought. Sort of cool, right? Sort of interesting. OK. Let's switch. Let's talk about visual communication. Um, are there any questions about sound before we move on to sight? Are you guys good? Everybody good? OK. Um, let's move on. That's pilot of love pilot. So first of all, I want to just briefly talk. That is not a dog, just in case. This is your, your no, you're not familiar. I want to talk briefly about what do dogs see. You know, we're always talking about visual communication and, and, and you know, what does that 
ear mean and what does the tail mean and what does that commissure change mean? But, but very rarely do I see people sort of step back and look at, well, what are dogs seeing, for heaven's sakes? What are dogs seeing? Well, there are a couple of things. We could spend a long time on this. Um, but first of all, I think most of you know that dogs are, are not colorblind, which is what used to be reported until about 10 years ago. People said dogs are colorblind. They are not colorblind, but they're red-green colorblind. Red and green look like gray to them. What they're really good at is seeing yellow and violet, and you'll see an example of that in a minute. I actually asked Kong once I was at, I think I was at APDT, and there was a big Kong display. And I went to the Kong representative, and, and I said, you know, we know that dogs are red, green, colorblind. They can't see red. So why are Kongs red? And this guy, who was so classic, I wish Alt had been there to tape it, this guy turns to me like Jerry Seinfeld and says, dogs don't buy Kongs. <laughs> <laughs> and we're primates, and guess what color gets our attention the best? <laughs> Why? It would be that ripe red fruit, right? Red, we love red. Red gets our attention more than any other color. Red is stimulating. Have you been to many restaurants that had a lot of red in them? Stimulates appetite. Red stimulates your appetite. Um, noise makes you drink more. So next time you go into a red and black noisy bar, <laughs> you are being manipulated. Um, so, so another thing we know is that dogs' acuity or their ability to resolve a fine focus to make things look really sharp is very poor. So when you take a kibble, you know that kibble we were talking about that you drop on the floor and they can't see it, it to them well might be the same shade hue, color of the floor, we know they're actually not as good as humans at discriminating between shades of gray. So they see red and green as gray. So they may see this gray thing on the floor, and the floor looks gray. And then they can't resolve the edges because their cute isn't very good. So they're, just, they're, just, they're not seeing it. They're just literally not seeing it. And it's not because they're stupid. It's because they're not you. <laughs> they're not primates. Um, however, this is what they're really great at. Dogs are phenomenal at sensing movement. Phenomenal. Humans need things to move 10 or 20 microns. Dogs, it can be just one. Dogs are phenomenal at sensing movement. Much, much better than we are. So that's something to keep in mind when you're training a dog um, or watching them respond to the world out there. We all know that when you try to take a picture of your dog when he's looking at you and your flash comes on, that you get like, you know, devil dog, right? The dog from Satan. Um, and that's because of what's called the tapetum lucidum. And that's an extra, um, an extra part of the eye that humans don't have. It's a membrane that reflects light back. Animals who are crepuscular or spend a lot of time in low light, dawn and dusk, that's what pre crepuscular is. Um, and it's very low light at dawn and dusk, and animals who are who evolved to be most active then usually have these tapetums. Humans do not have them. However, we have something. Um, we have eye, what's called eye shine, as you also know. It's, it's usually reflected in humans as red eye, and in that case, it's actually the light going back onto your retina, going past the retina and reflecting off blood vessels which is why it looks red, and then it reflects back. So that's what red eye is. And this picture of a cat is because this is shining off of the tapetum. This is a blue-eyed cat, and this is, this is, so you're seeing red eye in one eye and tapetum shine in another. Um, I just don't know what else to say about that cat, <laughs> except I'm not, I'm glad I'm not its applied animal behaviorist, but it's for cute. Um, so, this is actually, I downloaded this from the internet. There's an Android app where you take a picture with your Android phone, and then it will turn it into what a dog sees in terms of color. Not, I don't know, how cool is that? Yes, I was like, want that, want that, want that. 
So this is what you see, this is what your dog sees. This is what you see, dog, you, and I love this one especially. I think it's most important. Look at how red this stuff looks. See all this red? See, we see the white. Now, it's obviously, it's not exactly the same, but these are the same flowers, those are the same flowers. So we see red, purple, all they see is the blue part of that, and all they see is the yellow part of this. Dogs see blue and violet really, really well, but they are red, green, blind. Um, and I actually, I have, you know, what is the practical application of this? One is um, it's harder for a dog to find a red toy than it is a yellow one. Willie's, that frisbee you saw, I bought a blue one on purpose so that he could see it better. If you want to play scent games solely, then don't do a blue one. Do a red one if you're going to have it on the grass. I've also dressed in a way that I thought made myself more visible. So like, say I go walking in the woods. Um, I go, you know, when I had a whole ton of border collies, I go out on a walk with a ton of them, and I'm in the woods, and I would wear a yellow or like a light purple shirt so they could see me really easily, and I wouldn't fade into the green leaves. Okay. Um, I talked to, I've talked about how, how dogs are so much more chemically oriented than we are in terms of the sense of smell. Talked a little bit about sound. And, oh, the one thing about sound, I so apologize. I'm off order. I apologize. But, but I did want to say, can I just go back to sound for a minute? I'm sorry. Um, this is how my brain works. <laughs> Follow the bouncing ball. The, the one thing I did want to say about this book, about Through a Dog's Ear, is, is when I was talking about what are things we can do with, with an awareness of scent and what are things we can do or with this new awareness of sound, I talked about how we use our voices. But what I didn't talk about, and I really need to just for a minute, is to talk about the acoustic environment of a dog. One of the things that that book, Through a Dog's Ear, and talking to the author, convinced me of, he's a musicologist, and he spends his life thinking about the acoustic environment in which we all live. There are a lot of people who believe that we are living in, a noise, in an environment so noisy that it's part of what's overstressing our adrenal glands. I can actually tell you there's some people who I have a lot of faith in, but they're just speculating. You know all the food allergies that are sort of coming out of nowhere, like so many of us now are allergic to weed, etc. There's some people who argue that that's a dysfunction of the immune system, and that's actually because of overactive adrenal glands, and that's partly because we are surrounded by noise-producing or stress-producing noise all the time. So I read that book, and I thought about the fact of how often I'll have the morning news on when I'm not necessarily watching it, and I have a super sensitive, sound, sound sensitive border collie who's like pathologically sound sensitive. And I thought, what am I doing to him? You know? So if, you're, if you watch CSI, which I don't, but say you watch CSI, there's screaming, there's horror. What are dogs to think of this stuff? I think we need to be a lot more focused on what kind of acoustic environment our dogs live in. Um, and I think we need to be more thoughtful about the acoustic environment we live in as well. Um, there's a book about silence that I'll blog about in a couple of weeks that I'm reading right now. My sister sent me basically sort of in search of silence and how the world has become noisier and noisier. I think that has a lot of effect on our dogs. Um, and again, there's some people who think that actually has an indirect effect on why there's so many allergies coming out in dogs and in people. That's just speculation. It's not my field, but I find it interesting. Okay. Um, Back to research. This is some research I did. I regret to say I never published it, which means it has not been critically analyzed by other scientists. So it's important to keep this in mind. This is, rel this is preliminary in that um, it's never been published and never been, never been really critiqued by other scientists. Um, I'm probably not going to write it up because it was in 1990. Um, but so here's what we did. This is after I got my PhD and I started training. I started teaching. And so here I did this PhD on sound, right? And I'm all into sound and, and how to use it and what kind of sounds are more effective than others. And I'm thinking about that. And so I go to dog training classes and I start observing and teaching and watching. And I'm like, people are making all these noises and the dogs are paying no attention. The people are concentrating on what they say and yet the dogs are attending to their visual signals. 
And it was like, is that true? So I was really new to dogs. I had sort of that new, like, like beginner's mind, you know, that Buddhists talk about, of like, I can sell this from sort of a fresh perspective. So I decided to do some research on it. So we taught six litters of puppies to sit simultaneously to an action, to a movement, this. Within this hand, there was actually a little beeper. So when you moved your hand, it went beep. And as best we could, as precisely as I could, and we measured it, it was pretty darn close, the sound lasted exactly as long as the movement lasted. And it started when the movement started, and it stopped when the movement started. So that was pretty tight. So we had 24 six and a half week old puppies, four puppies from each litter. Um, and we taught them, they got a piece of food from the other hand. So it was, it was um, beep. So we didn't say sit. We just, we just had a, um, starting out, they had a piece of food. And they'd get their puppy's attention. And then they'd go beep. And if the puppy sat, it got a piece of food. Once they got to criteria, which was 85% correct every time you asked, then we tested them. And so we tested them by separating out these two, these two sensory modalities. The puppies were tested in a randomized order. Um, they got 10 requests to sit. Five were this. Five were beep. All right, both times the hand was presented as it was initially. So that was all the same. And then either the hand went up or there was a beep. And we simply recorded how the puppies responded. So I have it, I have it listed by litter, but um, there's no, there's not, this is not the kind of research that can show a litter effect necessarily. You'll see by the breeze involved that it's tempting to ascribe one, but not enough data to actually do that. So King Charles, um, Cavalier, King Charles, first of all, they did pretty darn well. I mean, this is pretty impressive. So each puppy had 10 tries, five visual, five acoustic. So this puppy got nine out of 10 right. That's pretty impressive. This puppy, three to one, puppy five to five. That's amazing, right? This one did all visual and that one responded, did not sit any time when he just heard the beep, okay? Well, that uh, doesn't really say very much. Let's look at the other litters and I'll just go through them pretty fast. Visual, a total of 16 right, a total of four right, two acoustic. Border Collies. <laughs> See what I mean about the breed effect? <laughs> Are they a visual species or a breed or what, right? So 20 to 5. Shepherds. 18 to 1. Miniature Schnauzer litter. <laughs> 16 to 0. And this next this next litter is the, that'll, that is what you get for calling your beagle to come when he's in the woods. Research. <laughs> These are statistically significant numbers. <laughs> and so what it suggested to me, and which is not news to you, is that visual signals overshadow acoustic ones. And that's what we need to, we need to specifically tell People in training classes, we need to remember that ourselves. Um, we need to tell people that in training classes, we need to tell our clients that. Because we are verbal and we focus on the verbal and we don't think of what we do. And not only that, but if we think we're being simultaneous, like, 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 sit. You actually started moving before that sound ever came out of your mouth. And, your, and visual signals are instantaneous, and sound has to travel through space. So it may not be have very far to go, but it's enough time that the brain sees this first. If you go sit, the brain is going to see this first, no matter how fast you think you said you're sit. So be very thoughtful about which, well, I like dogs to listen to both. Listen, I like dogs to respond to both. I really do. I love having visual signals. I love them. Um, and I teach them a lot by themselves first, then I'll add in an acoustic one. I want them both because it gives me so much flexibility. 
but be very thoughtful about the fact that we tend to do them both simultaneously, we think, and then basically the visual ones are overshadowing um, the acoustic ones. So, so now we're going to move into a different phase of, of um, looking at visual signals. And that's our observational abilities. Part of what I want to do this afternoon is I want us, this is going to be a workshop. We're going to practice observing. I want you to put, I know it's mid-afternoon, so drink your Coke or your tea or your coffee at break, because I really want your brains engaged, because it takes a lot of energy to be a good observer. And the best trainers are brilliant observers, right? We all know that. And you can train yourself to get better and better and better. I will never be done training myself to be a better observer. I will never see everything. Um, as a matter of fact, seminars, wow, all these eyes, it's so cool. Because you'll play stuff and then somebody will say, did you see this? It was like, no, I've watched it 79 times and I have never seen that. So one great thing to do is to watch videos with your friends. Write down what you saw, comment on them, and then play them again and talk about them. Do it over and over and over again. This is something that takes practice. All right, so I'm going to show you, I hope, a video. Um, it starts where you're not going to see a dog. Basically, you're going to see a camera walking into a door, <laughs> and then um, you're going to see a dog on the other side of the door responding to visitors entering. And I want you to just think about what you're seeing and describe the behavior. Ready? Okay, I'm going to stop it right there because that was a lot, right? So I'll, I'll repeat what you say so everybody can hear, but just throw out things you saw in a couple of words. On a leash, calm and sure, slightly forward. Good. Ears back. Good. Dog tended to back up. Good. Helicopter tail. I don't remember the tail. Good. We'll look at it again. Paw lift. Did anybody notice that the dog was standing on her toes? Did you notice that? Tippy toes? And then there was some paw, right? How about what else? Head low. I saw, did you pay attention to where the dog's center of gravity was? I thought the dog was basically pretty planted, um, and then I thought it shifted. I thought it shifted more and more to back over time. Is that right? See, I've watched this a million times, and now I'm like, do I remember right? After the person stood up. Should we watch it again? Yeah. All right. Ready? Ears are flat, and they're not flat in any which way. We'll talk about it. Up on its toes, backing up. I don't know if I'd call that a helicopter tail. Are we going to do that later? Okay. <laughs> Could I turn lights on? Could you bet? They're right there. It's a whale eye. Good. See the ears change? Ears went from flat. There are a lot of versions of flat. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. There's not just flat, right? There's flat at the base um, or out of the base and flat in the pinna. Um, can be flat up, flat down. We'll talk about that. I'm just curious. How, what would you describe as this dog's internal state? Conflicted. Excellent. That is exactly what I would say. Excellent. Did you get that? One of the things I've seen a lot, it took me years to figure this out, people would come up and say, oh, I thought I understood this stuff, but you know, I have this client dog and I can't read him because his commissure is forward, but his body is loose, or, his, or he's barking and growling at me, but um, his whole body is wagging. He, he looks friendly and then aggressive. And, and I cannot figure this dog out because his signals seem incompatible. And, and it took me years to be like, yes. 
His signals are incompatible. The dog is in conflict. And those are the dogs that often have serious behavioral problems. And those are the people who often struggle. You know, is, is one of the things that psychologists look for are congruent visual signals. Are all your visual signals congruent? So one of the things to look for is are the visual signals congruent on a dog you're looking at? Is the dog sort of pure one thing or pure another? Or is this big mishmash that confuses you? If you are confused, the dog is confused. Makes the dog a little bit more unpredictable, I would argue. Um, not necessarily more or less dangerous, but a little bit more unpredictable because you sort of don't know which way it's going to go. But don't, if you, if you feel like you know signals and you're seeing this mishmash of them, don't worry. It's not you. It's the dog is more confused than you are. Okay? It's very, very common. But it's hard to get, isn't it, everything that happened there, right? I mean, if I asked you to write down a full description of everything that happened, it'd be extremely hard, right? One of the first training that I got in ethology was I actually had some rodents in a, in a little glass box, like a laboratory case, on our tables. And our job was, the very first, first day in the lab, was to write down what the mouse was doing. And we had like five minutes to write down everything the mouse did. It was, unless your mouse was asleep, <laughs> in which you could write, you know what? That was still hard. Because people would say, mouse curled up sleeping. And then the teaching assistant would come by and say, well, what do you mean curled up? Describe curled up. Well, it's all sort of like, you know, in a ball. Well, where are its back legs? Where are its front, where are its front legs? Describe to me as if I was an alien the posture of this body. And that takes more than five minutes, as it turns out. So even if your mouse was sleeping, it was extremely hard. If your mouse was doing mousy things, it was ridiculous. People started laughing after a while, which was their point. This is how hard it is to accurately observe and describe behavior. Because a lot can happen in very little time, right? Very little time, what's very little time? A second? Would you say a second is very little time? Would you agree? Second's not long, right? Okay, I'm going to do what I can do in a second. You're going to count the second for me, and I'm going to do it, and then you're going to tell me how many things I was able to do. You ready? I'm going to count to three, and then you're all going to go one one thousandths. You ready? One, two, three. One, 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 one. <laughs> I like the hair. <laughs> I don't know if I can replicate that. <laughs> Replay. <laughs> no idea what I did, but it would be hard for you to all describe it, exactly what happened to this foot and this paw and this paw and my mouth and my commissure and my ears and my fur, right? It's really hard to do. So after they teach you that very humbling lesson, they start to teach you how to learn to be a better observer. That's what we're going to do. We're going to play ethology student this afternoon, how to be a better observer. Um, a reminder about message and meaning again. Remember with the message, there can be many, many messages and many, many meanings. One of the ways to look at any signal, including visual ones, is they can be expressions of internal states. And we use that a lot, like, you know, that's plaintive or that's, you know, a dis a, some people use the word despair in some of that earlier research. That dog is happy, that dog is friendly, that dog is nervous. They can be predictors of future behavior, I am about to bite you. Or they can be attempts to influence another, go away, come closer, cut it out, chill out. A lot of dog signals, canine signals, can be interpreted as distance increasing signals or distance decreasing signals. And I've seen that terminology a lot lately and it's really good. I really like it because it's a very descriptive it's descriptive. I worry sometimes it's a little functional and that we're assuming we know the dog wants to increase or decrease distance. So we have to be careful about at attribution, but I still think there's a lot of value in it. All right. You saw this video. Remember the dog barking? Um, you've heard it twice. You've seen it once. Now I don't want you to listen. I know a lot of you were watching because we can't turn our eyes off if our eyes are working. So now what I want you to do, 
is watch the dog. However, if I just told you to watch the whole dog, there is no way you would give me, any one of you would be able to give me an accurate description of that dog's behavior. It's not possible. But what if you just watched its tail? So let's all just watch the dog's tail. That's all we're going to do. Do, do not, yeah, no, actually go ahead and leave it on. No, thanks for asking. But um, let's go ahead and leave it on. All right, recording. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stop right there. There's, what do you see so far? The base is, the base is, that's what I mean by a high tail base. The base is erect. Um, there's a pretty big sweep of latitude, but it's side biased. Which, which way is it going? Yes, it's coming towards us. Very, very strong in this direction, correct? Okay. Yes, there was. I'll talk about it. <laughs> it was a study. Hello. Oh, now, did you just see? Did you see before? Did you see it go higher and curl over? That was interesting. What was that about? Because right after that, look what happened. The ears went back. The tail changed. And I know we're just supposed to pay attention to the tail. But... Can't miss it and can't miss the change in vocalizations as the tail changes. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it, babe. Tail base is now lower. See, it's now more horizontal. There's less side bias. The frequency of the wag has increased. It's faster. It's wagging faster. Oh, my God. Oh, they just wound up. But look how low the tail base is compared to the way it was before. So if we had time, which we don't, I don't we could do that with ears. We could do that with commissure. We could do that with center of gravity, right? We could do that over and over and over again. A great thing to do is to do this on your own. Is to just and Google. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Queen Google. <laughs> you can, I downloaded this from Google. You can go to Google and download dogs greeting, dogs doing this, dogs doing that, or you've got your own videos. There are a million videos back there for you to watch. Um, watch them and focus on one body part and one body part only. It will make a profound difference on how good you are. Because what happens is eventually, once you have your brain trained to these different templates, you can start putting them together. So you can watch the whole dog and you can get all kinds of stimuli um, that you wouldn't normally have gotten. You still can't get everything, but you'll get a lot better if you start by focusing on a little less. Less is more in the beginning. Oh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. She said, she had a good question. She said, what was the tail going to one side and not the other? And talk about some research that actually asked that question. So let's talk about some research that Michelle Wan did. Um, this is really great research. I just love this stuff. We'll do this before the break, and then we'll break. Michelle Wan at Columbia did a great PhD. I'm going to see her in, um, in uh, Phoenix. I'm really looking forward to it. So here's what she did. She, she, was, she wanted to know, here's the question. How good are people at observing dogs? And how much does dog experience affect their ability to observe and make attributions about a dog's behavior? So first of all, she canvassed the country uh, reaching out for interesting dog videos. And she chose 30 of them. And they were, I was on her PhD defense committee, and, and she was asked, well, why did you choose those sort of videos? What was your criteria? And she said, well, it was, one, whether you could see the dog, you know, quality, whether they were short enough for people to watch them. Um, and I wanted a range of different kinds of behaviors. So that was basically my criteria. They were sent in by people who considered to be experts in the field, applied behaviorists, um, um, I don't know if Kathy sent some. I know Suzanne had sent some. Um, and then she took these 30 videos and she asked eight people who are considered in the country to be experts 
to categorize the dog's emotional state based on their visual signals and to rate them in terms of intensity. 2,163 people then watched these videos. She did this, a lot of this online. There's a lot of great research going on online right now. It is such an exciting time. If you want to switch fields, by the way, so it's not a bad time to do it. It's very exciting. Um, so she categorized these participants into these four categories. Never owned a dog ever. Um, a dog owner, no professional experience, and, but she did have a subcategory. People who had one dog, people who had multiple dogs. I think it, I don't remember exactly. It might have been three categories, like one, you know, two or three, and then over three or something like that. And then people who are dog trainers, some kind of dog professional vets, vet assistants, dog trainers, groomers, um, who'd been working in the field less than 10 years, people who'd been working in the field over 10 years. And so everybody had to categorize um, a video. First of all, the category was you were asked to, to make an attribution of one of these emotions to the video you saw, with the understanding that no, they're not perfect. You know, but of all these things of what you're going to see, what is closest to what you see what you think the dog is expressing. And then, then you are asked to use a, a, a one to nine point scale, and you have one in your handout, by the way, um, whether it was sort of on the safe or the unsafe side, or the positive or the negative side. So go to that handout. In your handout, everybody get out their handout. You have a sheet, because we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play. I'm going to show you a video. Um, this first video is not the one you're going to do, all right? It's very short. It's just an example. This is from Suzanne Hetz. She took it at PetSmart. This is one of the shortest ones, so you don't have to rate this one. That's it. <laughs> you didn't see very much more than that face, but I get a lot out of that dog's face, all right? What does anybody have to say about that dog's face? Worried. I would say worried too. And, and I know a lot of people, I know many people who would say, oh, you're all being very anthropomorphic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, I, but if that was my dog, I would be like, okay, honey, what's wrong here? There are some other reasons for that. Um, I'll talk about them later. The dog's mouth is closed, right? All right. So. You're going to do this now on a different video. Do you have out your, nine, your scale, right? So I'm going to show you this video, and then you're going to select. You're going to go through and make all these selections. I will try and do something with this information between now and tomorrow afternoon, all right? Um, because I'm interested in what you guys come up with. But but I want you to do your best, all right? And I'll play it again. You, can, you, know, you don't have to just see it once. So are you ready? All right. So watch it first, then I'll play it again, then you can make your ratings. Ready to see it again? All right. I'll play it one more time. Okay. So I'll go back to that's the kind of scale you're using. All right. So just go ahead and fill yours out. Um, don't take too long, just because we're in the middle of a seminar. But this is something that you are totally feel free to replicate this. Make it a parlor game. Make it a game amongst trainers in a training club. It's a really great thing to do. This is all thanks to Michelle, um, Dr. Wan, for giving us access to this. You can go to her website, too, Michelle Wan, W-A-N. She's got some really cool stuff there. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Anne. Anne. Anne just asked a really good question. What do you mean by positive or negative? So 
That's a good question. I, here's my answer. <laughs> positive affect or negative affect? So is the dog in a positive state or a negative state? Okay? Affect being an internal emotion. That's a very good question. Uh, actually, she, it's a very, very good question. She said she wants to know how hot it was out there. I asked Michelle the exact same question, and she said, not at all. It was not very hot. Not very hot. I do not know. Good, yeah, I do not, good question. I do not know. I'm presuming that this was in the dog's home, you know, that the dog was on territory, but, I, but I'm just guessing. I don't know. So, okay, guys. Interesting process to go through, isn't it? So, um, so here's her results. First of all, um, first of all, the big thing she came out with is that there was a big disconnect between experienced and not experienced dog people in terms of how they categorized and, and described these dogs. And here are the two biggest differences. More experienced people, not this dog necessarily, but more experienced people are more likely to label dogs as being aroused, more highly aroused. Experienced people look at arousal, and it was very important to them, and they tended to, to categorize dogs as being aroused or more highly on the aroused scale than unexperienced, inexperienced people did. And, and, and I've seen this over and over and over again, and if, you're, if you've been in the field for a while, I'll bet you have too. More experienced people are really good at picking up, quote, negative emotions like, fear, sadness, or negative stress. Inexperienced people, and I'll, this is my words, not hers, are oblivious. They are oblivious. <laughs> I do not understand why. You'll, because many of our signs of it are very similar to a dog's signs. We just don't have furry faces and wet, cold, black noses. But they're very, very similar, but people do not see them. Um, that dog we just saw, I will tell you right now that a lot of people recorded that dog as a happy dog. <laughs> that was a happy dog. Because <laughs> his tail was wagging, right? His tail was wagging, he was smiling. That was a perfectly happy dog. Um, I, yeah. That was a very stressed dog. But the inexperienced people had very low ratings of stress. Experienced people had very high ratings of stress. All right? Big, big differences. But this is huge if you're working with the public or clients or a neighbor. This is huge, because I cannot tell you, I would be a bazillionaire if I had just a dollar for every time somebody said to me, oh no, he's fine. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> right? Would not we be? Would, I've never seen, he's never bitten before. <laughs> right. Nobody knows this better than dog trainers and UPS delivery men, <laughs> right? He's fine. Yeah, and so, but we need to remember that it's not our job to be smug about this. It's our job to be aware that they don't know. And that's why every dog training class in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I'm not doing dog training classes anymore, and my classes did not do this as much. We did it a lot, but I would do even more now of including in that a section on reading dogs. I think it's critical. I, remember that most of our classes have been derived from standard obedience, which was actually military work with dogs. And we've made tremendous strides since then. But we need to really look out of the box, really, really, really look out of the box and think, what do people need? And what they need more than anything in the world is to be able to read their dog. And they can't do it. <coughs> OK. So um, that's the scale you guys just worked on. Um, so for the stress ratings for this video, 
to see which was worst. Professionals gave it a 6.85 stress rating. Professionals. People with little dog experience gave it a four. Gave it in the fours. Fear in the fours for inexperienced, in the sixes for experienced. And it happened over and over and over again. It's absolutely universal. Um, here's something, here's another difference that, that she found. This is just a description of a different video, so don't let the Dalmatian part throw you. So when she asked people to describe what they saw, part of the survey was you had to write down what you saw. So here's less experienced owner. The Dalmatian is standing outside looking at the camera. All right? The, the mouse is asleep. <laughs> right? It, these are the experts. Direct gaze, looks away and back calmly. Gentle mid-position tail wag, relaxed muscles on body and face. Pupils normal, lips loose, and in gentle upward curve. That's how you need to be describing and looking at dogs. And a lot of you can do that already. I can already tell. Which is really, really wonderful. That Don't, wasn't the dog you saw. That was not the dog you saw. <laughs> Just playing with your mind. Just playing with your mind. That was not the dog you saw. All right? I guess... In a better world, if I was a better person, I would change that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't use that. OK. Um, we have a few minutes before break. Are you guys OK? Are you all right for another 5 or 10? Yeah. Right? I think it looks like they're set up for break. But let's go another few. You good? OK. Um, let's start. We're going to break things apart now. We're going to end the day breaking things into little pieces. And I, you know, for some of you, I want to say, a lot of you could do this yourself. A lot of you could be giving this talk about commissure and tail and whatever. Yay for you. Yay for all of us who can do that. I don't ever think I do this enough. I never get tired of it. So the, the, more, the more you do this, you know, did you, you know Malcolm Gladwell's books? Um, and uh, Blink, and what was the other one? Tipping Point. Tipping Point. Um, well, what is the one in which he talks about what makes great people great? Outliers. Outliers. Thank you. Like I told you, the mind is going. Outliers. One, the, the thing that he distinguished in that, and I've seen this from other people too, is that what makes people great is not so much their parents and not so much their inherent skill and not so much um, even their opportunity except as it relates to the amount of time they practice. It's so simple. It's just painfully simple. Um, the more you do this stuff, the more your brain starts to just file it away automatically, and the more you can see without having to consciously look at it. So practice is always good. So let's talk about whole body position. Um, this is a slide from What Is My Dog Saying? That's the CD back there that the Towsers have. I'm going to sell it later on my site, too. I just love this. What Is My Dog Saying is a PowerPoint CD that you can play to your class, to your trainers, to your shelter, to your vet clinic. And it's the best compilation of visual signals of dogs I have ever seen done. Thanks to Alta. Alta Towser is the one who saw this and went, this is phenomenal. This needs to be out there. So she's the one who helped get it produced and done. They have it for sale back there. It's, I think it's really, really good. And again, it's a PowerPoint. You guys can play it. Um, yes? Oh, we love her. She's doing a cat one. Yay, thank you, Kathy. She also has one. What is my dog saying at the dog park? Right? And that's, I think that's back there, too. This is great stuff. OK, so, so she, Carol, very, I called her not too long ago and said, you've got some great stuff. Would it be OK if I use it? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be good. <laughs> so here, I love this picture. There is nothing, if you want to look at dog postures, look at greetings. Because greetings are the most posture-rich contacts that I can think of. Look at this great, I mean, there is so much being said here, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, from tail position comparison, body lean comparison, standing on tiptoes versus 
Paul Ray's comparison, head forward direct, lateral head turn comparison. I mean, really, you know? So I'm going to show you some old videos that someone encouraged me to get digitized that I just got digitized. So they have, these haven't been shown in a very, very long time. They're not great quality, but, you know, I filmed them over, I don't know, 15, 18 years ago. Um, maybe not quite that long ago. Well, close. So we're going to look at whole body position right now before the break. And what I'm going to do before the break is I'm going to show you three videos of herding dogs. And what I want you to look at is the sheep's response to the dog. And I want you to compare the postures of the dogs um, towards each other. You're going to see, I think, five different dogs. And I want you to compare their postures and what happens. So you don't need any sound. Um, there actually isn't any. This is Pipite, the dog I said who saved Ayla's life, who was worthless on sheep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. So what I want you to now watch this. This is I slow. I, I had just learned slow mo at this point. Watch her center of gravity shift as this you tests her out. Nobody reads center of gravity and visual signals as well as sheep and dogs. Sheep are equally good at it. So first of all, where would you say her center of gravity is? Forward, backwards, or straight? I would say straight. All right, this is the exact opposite. <laughs> this, is, this is Luke when he was very young who barreled in there way too fast. All of his direction was forward. He caused that. That was his fault. He was right to nip her on the nose, but he caused that because he ran in the corner like an idiot. <laughs> so here I've slow-mo. He was really young here. He was so long ago. Watch him learn finesse. Now this ewe has two lambs. She can't leave her lambs to the wolf. So she has a tough spot here. And what, watch him start to learn finesse. He's going to stop when she faces him, but he's not giving anything. He just, right, see, just take a little bit. If I, take, if I go too fast, I force her to turn and fight me. Mom, what should I do now? <laughs> so do you see him starting to learn this finesse? And you saw how Pippi was like, I'm going to stand right square here, OK? And when the U challenged her, she went back a little bit. And the U saw it. Now compare that with, this is Lassie's, this is one of her first herding lessons. So I'm using Lassie on cattle. This is, this is earlier, it's like a year earlier. She was very young, maybe a year old. This is Beth Miller, um, a friend. I'm at her place. These are her Rambouillet ewes, very big, bony sheep, pretty scary to dogs. And last, there, all these dogs are being asked to take sheep out of a corner, which for those of you who don't herd, dogs aren't stupid. They know this is dangerous. These are huge animals. They can be killed. They get in between the sheep and the, and the fence, and the sheep will smash them. Barbie, I have a sheep I almost killed because she almost killed Lassie. She tried to. She waited until Lassie and I weren't looking, and she backed up, and she smashed Lassie into a post um, and hurt her, and hurt her pretty badly. I was so mad at that you. And we were leaving. We were walking out. Um, sheep can hurt dogs, and they know this is dangerous. So young dogs don't want to get sheep out of a corner because they're scared. And Lassie was never, Lassie was, oh, she's a wonderful herding dog. But, but, but she had some caution and hesitancy to her that she had to learn to get around. And she did. She could move anybody, even my ram. But it, she had to learn to use her power. So watch Lassie's center of gravity. And you're going to compare that with the next dog that you're going to see. So she's like, and, and Beth is doing everything right. She's actually teaching. See, she just protected Lassie from this. Watch this Suffolk. And so she's protecting Lassie, but she's moving the sheep, and so Lassie thinks she moved them. <laughs> Whoa. 
All right, there's actually three dogs on this tape. Here's a little dog who is never going to learn. This dog is just too fearful. And you see the center of gravity. You see, even though she's in a really, gr I used to think it was stalking posture, is, is that the lower their head and the more stalky they look, the more that they would impress the sheep. No, it's center of gravity. It's how far forward are they, or how far centered, or how far backward. Ethologists call it an intention movement. If you're leaning forward, what you're communicating is, the next thing I'm going to do is take another step forward. And so this dog is basically saying, the next thing I'm going to do, that I'm prepared to do, is run away from you. <laughs> and the sheep know that. And they, and they knew that with, with um, Lassie, more so with this one. Beth had to work harder to move the sheep. They knew that with Pip. Yes, yes. So this is Justin, who's, who's long gone over the Rainbow Bridge. And this is basically what you want. This is a dog whose every intention movement says, the next thing I'm going to do is come forward. But I'm not going to barrel in like Luke and scare everybody and cause a big ruckus. I'm just going to stand here confident and calm. And I'm just going to tell you, honey, <laughs> this is my space right here. And I'm taking it over now. I want it back. And he's going to get challenged. See that stomp? But look at what she just did. She turned. Little challenge. Look what he did. He lay down, but he never went backwards. Never went one inch backwards. He said, calm down but I'm not going backwards. You didn't scare me. Feel better now, girls? OK. Now, let's just all be nice about it and leave the corner. Gorgeous, right? Isn't that pretty? So I actually have one more herding video for you to watch. And this is Luke when he was a lot older and more experienced. And I just, there's some interesting stuff that goes on here. So I want to play this video for you, and I'll talk you through it. You won't hear any sound. So he's got a single, very difficult to work. She wants back to the barn. Watch her head, because she's going to tell you where she wants to go. And I should have sent him over here. That was my mistake. If he had even more experience, he would have flanked one foot over. Because she already said, he's got a rock here. He has a problem. See, she wants to go either way. So he's in a really tough spot. So they're in this great standoff. Um, if he comes over here, he'll lose her that way. If he comes over there, he'll lose her this way. So she just said she's going to go this way. And he tried to counter, but he didn't counter quite far enough. Because she's going to make a break for it. But he was ready. A lot of attention about not just body lean, but also which way the head turns. We're going to look at some um, videos a little later in which dogs are going to basically say, I'm going to tell you where I'm going to bite you. <laughs> um, OK. So here's a whole different context of center of gravity. This is, this is a Basenji. This is another YouTube video. Um, this is a Basenji being introduced. Whoops. Killer tigers. <laughs> so ask yourself where this dog's intention movements are. What, what is this dog signaling to these tigers <laughs> that he's about to do? Which is basically, I'm about to jump off of the bed. Somebody puts their hand there. I love that Basenji look. What? <laughs> I'm busy. Ah, ah, 
I love that. I love that. I gotta get you. And then the human has to come intervene and take all the fun away. But I put this in for two reasons. One is because that center of gravity, you know, the intention movements, which way is that, is, is that dog leaning, and what does that communicate about his next move. But as importantly, I put it in here because of the importance of what ethologists call supernormal sign stimuli. Supernormal sign stimuli is just a long phrase for some kind of a stimulus that gets an inherent reaction, and there are lots of those, and you take it and you make it even bigger. Super, I don't have it on your notes, I'm sorry. Super, like super, normal, sign, S-I-G-N, stimuli. Super, normal, sign, stimuli. Um, and sign stimuli are basically things that get inherent responses. Has anybody seen, um, if we have time, I'll play some uh, videos at the end of the PowerPoint. Has anybody seen um, Shrek 2? And there's a scene, it's Shrek 1 or Shrek 2 actually, there's a scene in which Shrek is a knight and the cat are being chased by the bad guys and they're on horseback and they're running into the castle and the cat says, you go! and turns to face the bad, evil knights who are running up to kill them. And his eyes. And he turns his head and he goes. <laughs> and his eyes get huge. And his forehead elongates. And he gets this little infantile look on his face. And all the soldiers were like, ah! Oh. <laughs> Infantile faces with disproportionately large eyes, disproportionate forehead ratios, and disproportionately large paws are sign stimuli. We see them, we go, oh, it actually elicits the production of oxytocin. You, oh, you actually increase your production of oxytocin when you see a kitten or a puppy or a Walt Disney character <laughs> exaggerating it, so the exaggeration is the supernormal. Um, I show a video, I'll show you later if I have time, I show a video to my students of a beetle in Australia. It's an orange beetle, it has a bumpy carapace shell, and the males are attracted to orange and bumpy. And during breeding season, they look for anything orange and bumpy, and it turns out in Australia there was a brand of beer that came in a bottle that was orange and bumpy. <laughs> so I show my university students who are just agog, pictures of these male beetles copulating or attempting to with beer bottles. <laughs> and it was such a problem, this beer was so common, it was such a problem that the, the beetle numbers were literally becoming threatened. No, the females were wandering around going like, you know, <laughs> like me at a Dolly Parton convention, <laughs> basically. You know, like, hello, hello. <laughs> Um, and so the beer company, it being Australia, and probably not this country, completely changed their bottling to save a beetle. How cool is that? So that's a supernormal sign stimulus. The reason I mention all this is because those of you who work with dog aggression cases would be very wise, and I know this is not a dog aggression seminar, I talk about it in the dog reactivity tape, stuffed dogs are great tools get a, a medium to large size one. They are wonderful tools. Be very careful with them because inherently they're stiff and in a threatening posture. But you can tell a lot about a dog by how they respond to these things. Willie or Luke ran, I had one in my yard when I first bought it. Luke ran up to it, circle wagging, hello, hello, I'm a dog, you're a dog, hello, I'm a dog. Pippi was like, um, oh, hi, I'm oh, hi. Um, and Tulip was like, <laughs> the UPS man, when he walked in and saw our fixed-eyed, stiff, static, immoving Rottweiler, literally dropped his package. <laughs> um, and I say that not metaphorically, but... 
would you edit that out? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is also from What Is My Dog Saying? Because I just love the, the, the combination of these two videos. We all know that that's a potentially threatening posture, right? This dog is looming over another dog. But, but most people would see this and go like, well, it was such a nice, friendly man, right? But look at the line. Look at how very similar those things are. They're very, very similar. Um, so remember I mentioned dogs are great at seeing motion. So the slightest movement forward is a big, big deal to a dog. And it's a big deal to us, too. I'm going to do a little demonstration. I'm just going to stand square, just square as best I can, center of gravity straight down as best I can. And I'm going to lean forward or backward the slightest amount I possibly can. I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it so you can't see it. All right? I really will. I'm going to try to fool you. So I want you to tell me which way I'm leaning, forward or backward. All right? So first I'm standing square. OK. I literally had decided to go backwards. And in order to go backwards, I involuntarily, <laughs> honest to God, went forward. It's easy to see, isn't it? Yeah. And if you're a dog, it's 20 times easier to see. So you call your dog to come, come. Oh, and they go like, OK, fine, I'll stay away. I'm a good dog. Come, come, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, right? Turn away, go away, move the other way, right? Looming is huge. Oh, oh, look, I put lines in for you to see. Um, so another whole body experience that's really important, or, or posture that's so important, that again is not intuitive to us primates is the direct head-on approach versus one, a curved arcing approach, including a curved arcing body. So there are really two things here. Here's the, here's the common primate greeting. These people are actually trying to get the dog to come to them. <laughs> yes, they are. And you can't see very well here, but that's a leash, and they're pulling on it. So the dog is, one, stopped by this because they're a border collie, basically saying, the next thing I do is going to, my intention movement is to take the space and stop you. And they're pulling on the dog. And we know how the muscles of mammals are oppositional, right? So when you pull, they automatically pull against the pressure. So you could not get a dog to stand still better than what they're doing. <laughs> As they would say in the, in the South, bless their heart. <laughs> Which I learned is not really something you want people to say about you. <laughs> not a lot of blessing there, really. Um, so this is an extreme version. Clearly, this, is an ex this is dog is in like hyper appeasement, right? I would say this is a very fearful dog. But look at how curved this is. That's sort of the supernormal sign stimulus, because it's so curved. But a good greeting involves a dog who, who's, whose approach is curved and whose body is a little curved as well. Okay? So think curve, not straight. There is one exception. This is Mark Beckoff, um, the scientist who studies animal behavior, play, animal emotions. He's in Colorado. This is Jethro, his soulmate dog, who's no longer with us. This is the exception of play bow. A play bow and play is, 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 well, there are a lot of things that happen during play that are exceptions, right? Dogs bite each other during play, and it's fine. Um, so if dogs are playing, you see this eye contact, direct face to face, and it's not problematic. Let me actually talk about play bows a minute, because Biologically, they're really interesting. I didn't know this till I did the, the DVD on play. I did a half-day seminar on play several times. It was really fun to do. I learned a ton. And one of the things I learned is that play bows are unique in the animal kingdom. There is no other animal that does 
anything approaching a play value except, except the family candidate. It's unique to canids. Um, there, there's some great visual signals here. See the ears, tail base versus tail base, moving forward, ears in a more natural position. Um, because I don't know this dog, I wouldn't know what to say about this. The fact that the paw is up makes me very, very happy. Yeah. Don't you read that the same way? Yeah. That makes me very, very happy. Um, I suspect that this is an intact male, and I suspect <laughs> <laughs> that that's an int it's a dog, it's a confirmation dog show. So I know they're intact, and I wouldn't, I, Bet you that's a female. <laughs>